right. In case we haven't done it enough yet, welcome to Red Rock Canyon State Park. Yay. 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 One of 278 Yay. state parks in the California State Park System. Yay. Started in 1969. Yay. Through a few expansions, it's now 27,000 acres. Most of it's on the other side of the highway where we were at uh, earlier today. Um, surrounded by BLM land, we have a lot of different uses in the park. What we were doing today, looking for fossils, we have birding, we have regular hiking. You have a Jeep or a good four-wheel drive, you're allowed to go out and do that. So, pretty multi-use park. And glad we could have you guys come out here. Really nice to see the show of support in these difficult budget times. Before we move on, Jesse has an announcement for what's going to be coming on later tonight. Yes, so, um, as soon as we leave here, we'll go back to the campsite. Um, we'll have the campfire and s'mores up there, but um, around 8.30 or so, I think, I'm going to be leading a little night hike up onto the ridge. So when you go back to Helen Sandals, put on some good shoes, and we'll go on a little uh, hike after dark. And it'll be about a half hour or so. The moon will be out. Yeah, the moon will be out. Yeah. Walking yeah. flashlights. Gonna have also, if you, any of you have had a chance to visit the visitor center and poke around in there, you can directly thank the lovely people sitting back up at that table. They are the Red Rock Canyon Association. And as I was mentioning, our budget is so bad, I can't afford to pay the person to be in there. So the RCA has generously donated the money to fund the people to be in there for this particular visit. Without further ado, the people that you have been, the, the person you have been waiting to see this whole time, the one, the only, the world renowned, oh. Dr. Dave Whistler! Yeah. Woo -hoo -hoo. Dr. Dave! So, oh. Oh. <laughs> so, just for my information, is there anybody here who doesn't know me? Anybody new that's just come down? Oh, we have good. We have some. <laughs> Other people. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty. It's my first trip. That's nice. true. Well, that's right. We'd like to get to know you better. People like that. Well, when they find that out, they won't want to. <laughs> well, thanks, Mark, for introducing me. Before I get on, that was the last week. That was the last time. Matt. Hello, Mark Matt. Yes. <laughs> old age. Yes, old age. Yes. So, uh, there's a couple of uh, announcements. First, we have a birthday among the group that's with the Natural History Museum. Uh, and so we should all give a round of applause for Elliot. And Yay! And then our own who Jeff. Candles, candles, put them on one of my oh, Okay. <laughs> and our very own Jesse has a birthday as of what? Midnight tonight, I understand. <laughs> so, uh, well, all of you pretty much know me. The few who don't, I'm Dr. Dave Whistler. I've been working out here forever, it seems. They found me under a rock one day and resurrected me, and I've been doing it ever since. I actually did do my doctoral dissertation on the geology and paleontology of Red Rock Canyon, so it goes back a few years. So, uh, And I'm just going to give you a few general words about it, and then we'll get on to the real program, which is that tonight. We're going to do something much different tonight. So, uh, But uh, just so you know, there will be a nature hike tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock, and I will talk a lot more about the geology then. And with my group, we've already talked about some of the fossils. But Red Rock Canyon is really a very good and almost unique. You can't really use any word unique because it means one of a kind. There are others, but... Red Rock Canyon is a fabulous geologic classroom out in the field. The reason being is there's a lot of rocks. My group has seen a lot of them today working with me. And the rocks do, are well exposed. They span a lot of geologic time, about 8 million to 12 and a half million years of time is, is represented by the deposits you see here in Red Rock Canyon State Park. Most of those rocks have some fossils in them, at least, sometimes more, sometimes fewer fossils, but work has been going on since about 1905 on collecting the fossils out here. And in that period of time, there are literally tens of thousands of specimens that have been recovered. The bulk of those are at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. We are a repository for the state park system. 
uh, the fossils are on loan to us. The early work here was actually done by the University of California, Berkeley, which is my alma mater where I got my degree. So there are collections there, but the collections at Berkeley would fit into two cabinets. The collections at the Natural History Museum in LA fill about 12 cabinets or 10 cabinets, I think it is now. So a lot of fossils. A lot of animal diversity has come out of that, uh, having collected for all those years. And although the people working with me today notice that we only find a scrap here, scrap there, if you accumulate that knowledge over all that time, we really have an awfully good picture of what was living here. And it changes from the bottom to the top through time. The paleoclimate changes a bit, and the fossils also change in response to that. We know now, or we think we know now today, geologically, what the area looked like and where it was with respect to what it is today. Today, it's sitting where we are now, but back when these rocks were being deposited, they were actually 40 miles east of here, uh, north of Fort Irwin. And they were also, all of North America was compressed at that time and pushed up. And elevation-wise, when these rocks were being deposited, when the streams that deposited these things on the lake shores, we were probably as much as 8,000 feet up on top of the mountain plateau on top of the mountain range. Uh, and so the climate clearly would have been different if it was that high. Only in the last two to five million years has it become stretched the North American continent and this come back down again to the elevation of around 3,000 about 3,000 feet today. So it was not a desert when these rocks were being deposited. It was semi-arid, but nowhere near the desert type conditions we are today. And the diversity of animals sort of speaks to that because if you go out in the desert day and look for big animals, and we talked about this yesterday, the biggest thing you find out here today is, is a mangy coyote, widely looking for the uh, roadrunner, right, chasing after it. So that's the biggest thing you see here now. And yet the fossils we were finding today, we were finding large camels, rhinoceroses, horses, uh, Gary and I, before you got here, found a fox, which is not that big, but uh, we did find, yes, we did find antelope today. We found antelope today, so a big diversity of animals, so a much different thing. And, and there's a wonderful little exhibit in the Interpretive Center that those who have not seen it, I encourage you to go look at it. It tells you a little bit more about the fossils, but I don't want to ramble on tonight because I really want Jal Ming to get a chance. I mean, I asked him to do this tonight. I said, I'm getting tired and the people are getting tired of hearing about Red Rock. So we need to do something different for a change. Show them that other fun research is going on. Those of you who pay attention and read the newspaper or are up at 4 o'clock in the morning listening to public radio, you heard about a discovery of some woolly rhinoceroses pre-Ice Age. Woolly rhinoceros in the Tibetan Plateau that apparently were already woolly and already had some of the adaptations which would suit them very well once glacial conditions and snow conditions kick in. And the authors of that study happen to be Zhao Ming, our very own Zhao Ming, and Gary Takeuchi, who's out there. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm standing here. Would I be in front of somebody? That, uh, <laughs> because I'm, I don't want to block my my talk. Would that be okay? I can see the yeah. screen too, so it's okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, maybe you can see it's, it's just a little bit. Uh, just a little. I'm okay. Um, anyway, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, they. Uh, for a little, as, as Dave said, uh, we'll do a little change of, um, and uh, we'll talk about something more exotic uh, and uh, far away uh, from here. But uh, this is a great audience because uh, you guys know the basics of stratigraphy and the uh, evolution. So uh, this is something that uh, I will rely on as I talk about what's going on in the other side of the world that uh, over the past uh, 12 million years, uh, not, I mean 12 years or so, <laughs> 12 years or so I've uh, been leading uh, uh, fossil collecting teams uh, and uh, people, some, some of people you know that like uh, Gary Takeuchi and then Jack Zung has been in my team 
to contribute in the knowledge that we gained from Tibet. Um, so uh, this is what this is the artist reconstruction work. We we're visit the author a while, um, but uh, this is the animal that we're going to be talking about in High Tibet uh, at the foothills of the Himalayas. Just a little bit of a science. Uh, I apologize that uh, I just have to give a, you a little bit of a background before we can uh, talk about the, 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 the fun part, which is the animal. Um, the ice age is a, basically the last couple of million years of time. If, if you're looking at this, this little chart, the time scale is, uh, this is 65 million years or so. This is when the dinosaur became extinct. And going to the present day, this is the zero, is the present day. So the, this little chart, basically this little curve, is the climate. Um, so it, it's essentially the global temperature of the past. Uh, what this means is that about 55 million years or so, the, the, the Earth is about 12 degrees centigrade uh, hotter than it is today. And uh, in the, you notice in the last two million years or so, uh, the Earth has plunged uh, down below about eight degrees or so be below the present time. Uh, if you enlarge these two million years interval, you'll find the Earth actually was going through violent climatic changes uh, up and down, up and down. Really, really, in every 100,000 years or so, there is a dramatic change, reversal of ice age or ice free climate. So uh, our woolly rhino story relates to the last part of the Cenozoic uh, era. So with that, um, I'll just march on. So again, what is the megafauna? Uh, megafauna in the ice age essentially means that uh, the animals that are living during the Ice Age, and uh, many of you are familiar with I megafauna because if you go to our Page Museum, these are the animals that you see. Uh, this is a reconstruction of the megafauna living right uh, about 14,000 years ago in LA. Uh, if you look at this, this, these are the San Gabriel Mountains uh, in, the, in the distance, and various large mammals, they tend to be um, 10, 20 percent larger than the present day uh, mammals. Even for the same species, they tend to be a little larger uh, because the climate is a little cooler. So that's one of the reasons that they, they are called megafauna. So our Tibetan animals relate to this, uh, as I, I'm going to be showing you. Um, this is going to be showing you in a, just a little bit of animation of why Tibet is important. Why do we go to Tibet to collect fossils? The reason Tibet is important is Tibet is uh, giving us a really a unique window to look at the past climate change and also the, um, the animal that live in there. So I want you, your eye to concentrate in this area um, to see what happens. Basically, this is uh, Asia, and this is Africa, and this, this is where we are in North America. Don't worry about the rest of the part, just look at this part and you will find out Asia is hitting, uh, I'm sorry, India. India is hitting Asia uh, rapidly during the past 60 million years or so. This is a number of millions of years from the present day. Okay. Um, does it happen? Okay, there we go. Um, so you see that uh, India now has, by 50 million years ago, has hit Tibet. And then you see these white patch area is where the Tibetan plateau is. Um, and you can see the plate tectonics, basically the movements of continent, has resulted in a dramatic uplift of a giant landmass about five sides of California. Um, and they uplifted above the sea level uh, on average 
by about 15,000 feet above sea level. So it is a giant land mass and, uh, and there's a lot of interesting things happens in there. Um, this is a close-up of the Tibetan plateau and you can see that they are pretty much covered by snow and uh, very high again. Uh, this is India and this is China uh, to the north. And the Tibetan plateau is often being referred to as the roof of the world or the third pole of the roof of the, of the world because it's so cold, because it's a high elevation. And that will come into a relevant, uh, become relevant because when we're talking about the Wuyi Rhino. All right, um, Tibet in the present day is cold because it's high which we all understand because high elevation tend to produce cold climate and also very dry. Um, the, the, the people that you're seeing actually, this is Gary, this is Jack. Um, so this, <laughs> this is just show you how dry it is, actually drier than it is here. Uh, there's not a single blade of grass you can see uh, in, these, uh, in these pictures. Um, but we'll leave the dry part of the Tibet. Um, we're not going to have the time to talk about that. We'll be concentrating on the cold part of the Tibetan um, plateau and its effect. When you have a high Tibetan plateau in this location, what it means is that the environment in Tibet is equivalent to about 3,200 kilometers to the north. Basically, if you are living in the Tibetan Plateau, you might be as well living in the Arctic Circle. Uh, it's equivalent in terms of the climate and the temperatures. Uh, and that's why that uh, uh, we're, when we are seeing our woolly rhino, uh, it's not surprising to see a cold adapted animal living in the high, uh, high plateau. Okay, um, well, I guess I, I am going to talk a, a, a word about the, the dryness. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not done because I, uh, I want to show you another uh, beautiful uh, picture of an of animal that we uh, recovered uh, with Jack and, and, and uh, Gary uh, from this place. Uh, the, the northern Tibet is so dry uh, that the areas uh, like this is is it's actually called ghost towns. Um, the reason is like a ghost town is because um, the whole air, the little hills are all eroded by wind. Uh, these are wind erosion features. Uh, locally, is called yadan yadan topography. Um, they are so dry. There's no water. Uh, so erosion is entirely by the northwesterly wind in the, during the winter. So it's, it's an incredible landscape. And luckily, we actually found uh, really nice fish fossils right near some of these humps of hills. Uh, this is a, just to show you we're actually working in there and uh, digging up fossil fishes there. And uh, the fish that is so wonderful about that place is that we found these fish in these places that are having these really thick bones. Yeah. If you see this particular bone, this a single bone is equivalent to one of these little spin ribs wow. of, wow. of a fish. And you can see these rib bones are actually touching each other, overlapping with each other. So these guys are really full of bones. Uh, none of the modern fishes has this kind of peculiar adaptations. The reason that these fishes have these thick bones is because these fishes are living in a very dry environment. Uh, these lakes that they are living in are really highly salty. These are what we call hypersaline lakes. And, and therefore, these fishes are actually inundated by high concentrations of salt and the other mineral contents in there, and their bones are all become somewhat pathological. They are just becoming really thick bones, fishes. 
So that's, I mean, that's just a really direct way using fossil, just like we are collecting here, to demonstrate the past environment. <coughs> uh, and it's a very unique environment in the past. The bone that you pointed at, what is that, about six inches? Is that the scale on that? The, yeah, it's, it's about, uh, is that yeah, this is about a, a probably a centimeter or so across. Okay. So this is about 10 centimeters. So this is about, um, yeah, about a, uh, a foot or so oh, along. Okay. Yeah, okay. About a foot along uh, of a fish. Thank yes. you. And how tall are the yadan? What was the perspective? So those are probably in the, uh, let's say, uh, 30 feet to 50 feet. <laughs> they are, they are, they are not that tall. Uh, they are just all carved by just incredible winds uh, in, the, in the winters coming down from the Siberia. Okay, so that leave, uh, let me leave the story about the dryness uh, behind and then let's just concentrate about what the cold climate will produce. And this uh, is uh, the story that we're going to be telling mainly tonight. Um, I'm going to be just showing that how we go about working in Tibetan Plateau. We usually started out from here in Xining, and we go all the way to the southwestern corner of, uh, it's called the Basin of Jada Basin, right in here. Um, in between, it literally takes us more than a week of driving. Uh, so it's a long, long, this long way uh, to drive across. And along the way, there are actually some hazard uh, and then some some challenge that you have to deal with. Um, in some of the mountain passes, right in the middle of July, uh, it will be snowed out, uh, and then you can't really pass it. Uh, um, and there will a lot of places has no road at all. I mean, this is very very common to see it every day. Uh, car gets stuck. And of course, there are thin air uh, where Jack has these, uh, where these uh, <laughs> oxygen generation uh, machines that literally installed in every seat of the trains. Uh, the Trans Tibetan trains we use uh, have an oxygen tube that you can uh, pull out and then breathe oxygen uh, in high elevation. And we, wow. uh, the road hazard actually, we actually literally ruined our car. The car flipped over and oh, these are the four people that actually as the passenger of the car. All of us uh, came out survived just fine but uh, the car is pretty much ruined. <laughs> so so working to that uh, has its own challenges uh, there. Um, is not a piece of cake. Um, very very different from what it is uh, like here. All right um, so off we go to Jada. So this is the, the beautiful Jada Basin, and you can see the, the exposure, the, just like the, what you see in the, in the camp, uh, except it's much larger. You have a question? I was I, I just about to mention that look, the grooves on it look exactly like the ones that you see. Today. <laughs> yeah, like right, right, right over there. Except it's, it's a little larger. Yes, yes. Um, yeah. it's, that's it's, yeah. that's it's a, the paleontological, uh, yeah, Pale paleontologists love these kind of places. So <laughs> just to give you a larger view of the Jada Basin, this is the Himalaya, the mountain chain of Himalaya. So we are literally at the foothills of the Himalaya and uh, we are facing these wonderful uh, exposures uh, that are several hundred kilometers, not kilometers, several hundred meters uh, high. Uh, and it's very, in those elevations, it's actually presenting quite a challenge to climb up and down every day. Um, and the, the exposure, as I said, is just a really paleontological heaven. Um, I, in my life, I have not seen as well exposed uh, areas like this. And we're talking about a basin that is about 100 kilometers long, 20 kilometers across. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's an endless area to work on. And we barely scratched the surface in our about four years uh, of work in, in the Jada Basin. 
So um, we did uh, just just a little bit more science here um, uh, about stratigraphy. Uh, Dave would uh, love to talk about these things. Um, and basically, uh, this is not meant to be read. Each one of these lines means uh, a particular species of fossils that has been occurring in, let's say, in this strata in here, like the rocks in here. Let's say you find a few animals in this layer in here, and then a few animals in that layer, then you basically connect the line together, say, okay, this animal are known to live from here to here, okay? Um, this is how the science of stratigraphy is done. And this is a wonderful way to work on the stratigraphy because everything is so clearly exposed, you can just look at it and then just basically visually compare where you are um, in the uh, in stratigraphy and then find out where the fossils are. Anyway, we have other means to de determine the age relationship uh, that I won't uh, won't talk anywhere. Um, so um, in an area like this, uh, this is a, uh, in the northeast in Jada in 2007. Um, I personally uh, went to this area uh, in the late afternoon. I think in this spot or more or less in here, um, I found a woolly rhino skull in 2007. There we go. And uh, fortunately, uh, Gary was with us. And Gary immediately took over uh, to, uh, to orchestrate the excavation of the woolly rhino skull. Uh, it took us almost a whole week to um, dig it out uh, and then have improvised with limited equipment and also supplies of plaster. Uh, we managed to bring it home uh, after thousands of uh, kilometers of drive, bumpy road, uh, safely back home. And uh, lo and behold, we found out this animal is a woolly rhino. The reason we think it is the a The country of Tibet, Tibet had no problem with you taking out this precious... Uh, the Tibet is part of under, uh, under Chinese government. So we have to apply for permission from the Chinese government and also from the local Tibetan government as well. Uh, it's also provincial government, that is. Um, so is a, uh, the, the specimens belong to the government of China. Uh, and, and therefore, you can take it, we took it to Beijing uh, in the Chinese Academy of Science. Um, is that's, That is okay, but we would not be able to take it out, out of the country. Uh, so it's still inside in, uh, in Beijing now. So the reason we think this is a woolly rhino is because of a couple of three things. Uh, one is that if you look at the skull, this is the skull, uh, it's basically the top part of it. You're looking from top down, you'll find these rough areas uh, in front of the skull. And this is the area is the, where the, uh, what we call the uh, nasal horns, basically the horns in front of it, it attached it. So it's these rough areas in the skull is a clear indication of the shape of the horns. Um, what we find out is that there is a ridge in these, uh, on, on this skull, skull, and that ridge is very, very character characteristic of the woolly rhinos. Uh, I will I'll tell you why that uh, that is the case uh, in a couple uh, pictures later. The other thing uh, we also know uh, this is a woolly rhino is because they, they, the horns is leaning forward. Okay, they, you, you kind of see that the, uh, the, the horn is actually at an angle from the, um, from the top of the skull. So the next slide probably will show you better. Well, maybe the, another one. Um, just hang on with me. Uh, the, the woolly rhino is a great story because woolly rhinos are known uh, to humans. Basically, the uh, they ancient people uh, in Europe, uh, these are the late Ice Age people, 
that did all of the wonderful paintings in France actually managed to record uh, woody rhinos in their own art. So this is this particular one is a cave art of a woody rhino. This is a tracing of that the same art, and you can see these woody rhino actually has wolves, a long, long hairs, trailing down from the head and also from the belly, <coughs> just like the modern Tibetan yak. If you have seen the Tibetan yak, you realize that the yak has long, long hairs uh, hanging down, dangling down from the belly and also the neck region. So the woolly rhino, uh, we know that these woolly rhino during the Ice Age, they are well adapted to the cold environment because they have these long wolves uh, on the body. And here are some more pictures of the woolly rhino from the, some of the French cave art paintings. Uh, again, some of them you can see that there are long wolves uh, and also you can see these long hairs uh, in the woolly rhino. Okay, the, getting back to the horns again, uh, why these are woolly rhino horns. Um, the woolly rhino horn, this is a reconstruction of a woolly rhino, and this is a, an African uh, white rhino. Uh, and if you see the, the difference of the meaning the, of the, the horn orientation, basically, you see the tip of the horns pointing straight up up to from the, 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 the top of the skull, whereas in the woolly rhino is, is leaning forward in front of the nose. Okay, uh, again, showing you a little bit of a red line, you can see how the, the leaning of the horns is different. This will become important uh, as I talk about uh, the next part. The reason that they, these horns are leaning forward in front of the nose is because scientists think woody rhino use the horns as a snow sweeper just like this <laughs> uh, so because the woody rhinos live in cold snowy environment in the especially during the winter they need to sweep the snow to clear uh, the, uh, the the pasture to questions mm -hmm. um, um. Um, I took looking at the horns, and so, um, you know how it kind of curves back like that? Uh-huh. It could, um, if a predator tried to do it, um, um, it could charge at it, and then it could lift backwards really hard, and then the little front could come in, and then it could, then it, it could swing its head and, and slow it. I think, I think you are absolutely right, except <laughs> most of the carnivores are wise enough not to challenge woolly rhinos. Like maybe when they're starving, that might. Be <laughs> maybe yes. Maybe they are really thick or maybe so. Yes. Uh, but anyway, it's a it's a it's a good use of their horns. Another question. Um, did the woolly rhino go extinct? Yes, it died by about ten thousand years ago, uh, when the last ice age became uh, finished. Uh, the woolly rhino became is gone along with the last of the ice age. Okay, so um, so why do we think that the woolly rhino sweep uh, snows with their horns? Uh, here's the, I, I'm going to show you why. Again, because woolly rhinos love coldness and, and their, their fossil horns actually are preserved in the Siberia permafrost. Uh, so if you go to really the northern Siberia, inside the Arctic Circle, you can actually find occasionally woolly rhino horns and hairs, long hairs of the woolly rhinos. And uh, if you look at the horns, what you find, the woolly rhino horns has a very characteristic flattened horn. This, this, this flattened view is basically, uh, if you cut across the horn across here and see it from top down. This is the shape of the horns. It's Basically, it's squished uh, very flat. What this means is that these woolly rhino are using the horns like a paddle. I mean, if you want to sweep snow, it's better to use the horns like a paddle as opposed to a stick, right? Make sense? All right. 
Um, not only that, uh, that woolly rhinos have a f flattened horns, but the if you look at closely at a woolly rhino horns, this is one of the specimens that um, I saw it in Natural History Museum. Um, if you look closely enough, um, you see these these lines of curves of a woolly rhino horns, right? Mm -hmm. And what is odd about this specimen is that a lot of these lines actually got cut off right in here. They start right in here. Hmm. The reason uh -huh. they are being cut off is because these woolly rhino horns are being worn down, worn away. Let me show you that. This much of the original woolly rhino horns has been basically worn flat, worn. Uh, so they, you see the, the, the really, really straight, flat, wearing what we call wearing facet. It's basically just the area in front of the horns, these red areas that are literally worn flat uh, as because they are literally pushing the snow all the time and using the horns. So that's how scientists know uh, woolly rhino horns are used for snow sweeping. Um, again, uh, another specimen just to show you, again, it has a very, very distinct uh, wear facet in front of the horns. So this is the reason that we have some good re reason to suspect that these woolly rhinos, not only they are comfortable in terms of having a really thick coat to uh, be warm uh, in, the, in, the coat, in the coat bag, but also they actually are equipped to dig into the snows to feed during the winters. Um, so this is, a, once again, a close-up view of our artistic reconstructions of our Tibetan woolly rhinos, again showing exactly what we think these woolly rhinos were capable of doing. And they are sweeping snows, re revealing the vegetation underneath the snow. And once again, you notice our artist has purposely uh, sh reconstructed a flattened front surface of the, the woolly rhino horns that for the purpose of surviving during the winter. Okay, so so it's as the um, it's as the uh, the, um, the why the we think the woolly rhino in Tibet are so important. Uh, they because they showed us that these animals are living before the ice age. Uh, Ice Age again started about 2.7 million years ago, but these Tibetan woolly rhinos lived about four to two million years of uh, of age. So they are actually predating the Ice Age megafauna. Um, so what this means is that during the uh, these Tibetan woolly rhinos time, the rest of the world has no ice. There is no ice age. Uh, so these woolly rhinos somehow adapted to the cold environment high up in Tibetan Plateau. And uh, when the ice age came along later, about 2.5 million years or so, these Tibetan uh, woolly rhinos simply came down from high Tibet. So this is a scenario that we sort of vision in our uh, Tibetan uh, paper uh, published uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, basically, our Tibetan woolly rhino is starting from here in southern Tibet, really high in elevation, about 15,000 feet in elevation, and through some intermediate, or what we call translational species of woolly rhinos that are living in the early uh, Ice Age, what they call early Pleistocene, they somehow migrated and extended their range. Eventually, they expanded to the unpaired Europe and Asia. They, the green area, the unpaired green area, is the maximum distribution of woolly rhinos during the late Ice Age or, or the late Pleistocene. So, our scenario basically is woolly rhinos originated, or the ancestral woolly rhino originated in Tibet, and they came down to the, um, 
to the northern areas to seek comfort uh, in the in the cold environment. So I, are you saying that it was actually too cold for them, and then they came down to where it was only very cold? <laughs> I think I think you are. I, I suspect you are probably right that. Uh, if they, uh, during the Ice Age, even the woolly rhino probably can't make it up in the Tibet. It, it, it probably must be horrendously cold there. I mean, if, if when you have added all of the elevation to it, 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 it could very well be. But we, we fell short of saying that in our paper. Um, we don't really have evidence about it. Question again. Okay. Yeah. What if there was a really, a really, really woolly rhino living up there? Is now. there a really now? Um, I'm, um, a, a oh, you want when it got really cold? Um, when it got really cold, uh, could they adapt it to get really, 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 really airy? I think that's what we're thinking. That's what we're trying to... But it's um, kind of like undiscovered. Oh, <laughs> well... When it comes to how much woolly uh, they become, uh, we don't really have evidence of uh, how much wool because these these early woolly rhinos do not preserve furs. So we just have to guess how cold it is. Um, it certainly is very, very cold um, compared to the that rest of the world. The later I say, could they have adapted to get like really, really, really cold? They, they could, they could. The Ice Age, especially up to the northern part of the, uh, the country, yeah. Um, let me just show you one last one, just to give you a visual kind of a uh, sort of a visual cue of what, what we really, what, what we happened, what we think happened. Basically, before the Ice Age, we have the woolly rhino and the Ice Age, the whole northern ice sheet will come down and then the woolly rhino basically goes up. Uh, that is the story we were trying to tell uh, in our, uh, in our uh, paper in the two or three weeks ago. So now I'm ready to take all of the questions you have. Were you the first people to find a woolly rhino in Tibet? We are absolutely the very first person. Um, there, are, there is one <laughs> And I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm very pleased that I actually personally discovered that myself. <laughs> so it's, it's an enormous honor and a an privilege to work in their er that area and you actually find a, 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 my personal <laughs> best fossils in there. As well. <laughs> and it was way older than any of the other woolly up rhinos. It was way old, at least more than a million years older than any of the known ice age. Uh, I say woolly rhino. Yes. Um, Go ahead. I was just wondering if any animals could survive at the high altitude during the ice age. I think they can. Uh, if you if you go to um, if you go to the present day of the uh, high plateau, um, you can survive there. Um, I mean, you have to put a lot, of, a lot of layers uh, right. to survive there. But they are that cold. There are, there are animals like the yak, the animal, the cow-like animals. They have really, really thick fur fur. And, and there is, there is a particular horse called Tibetan ass uh, that's also surviving up there just fine. Uh. So, so there are animals who can actually deal with that kind of climate. Uh -huh. So Tibet is not unlivable. It's actually uh, animals and people can survive there. Just like animals uh, up in northern, uh, in the Arctic Circle, they can make a living year round. Yes. You have a question? I'm sorry, I'll, um, I'll get to you. Yeah. What year was the woolly mammals extinct? What year? See, that is a great question. I have no answer for that. Um, but basically, I, I do not know. Um, maybe, uh, I mean, if it is. In North America, often one of the factors that's been used is probably uh, humans may have overkilled uh, some of the megafauna um, elements. Uh, in Asia and Europe, uh, apparently humans do not have as big of an effect in uh, the causing the extinction of these animals. 
So we don't really know. So climate may have done it, but then you may re recall in my very first picture, during the ice age, there are, there are many, many ups and downs of uh, climate changes. Mm -hmm. And many, during up to a dozen, actually two dozen of these uh, climate up and downs, woolly rhinos survived. But only the last one, they died. Yes, your Would the, uh, the fact that the ice age moved in have made things colder in Tibet? I think they, they, it must be. Would yeah. the flora have survived that extra batch of cold? <clears throat> I think that, that is, a, we have, at the moment, we have no ice age uh, fossils to tell us anything about it. So Tibet is, is very much of a scientific um, sort of unknown there. That uh, that's one of the reasons that drive us to there, to study Tibet. Um, so there are so much that we have not learned yet. I come back to you. Let's give a chance to the gentleman. The, the living rhinos are you know divided into grazers and browsers. Right. So your argument about sweeping, I assume this is a browsing. Excuse me, a grazing rhino, not a browsing rhino. So that, is, is that's that's. Can you tell from the lip structure? And the front teeth, if it's if it looks like a, a, a grazer as opposed to a browser, uh, I that that's a uh, is is a great question. Um, from uh, the we can actually uh, tell the uh, from the uh, what we call the uh, the the carbon isotope, basically the chemistry of the the enamels, the shiny substance of the teeth. Uh, through that, we can tell that they are more likely to be browsers. Uh, and this is consistent with the, their teeth being relatively, what we call relatively low crown. Um, so um, so is this particular scenario do suggest that they are grazing, right? So, so yeah, is it, it's actually, uh, you can say that there is some uncertainty in how these animals actually use the horns and, and actually graze. Yeah, some um, of the Tibetan plateau, even now, there's not very many leaf, 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 leaf plants. So. Right. Yeah. Well, well, Tibetan plateau uh, not have, don't have a whole lot of grasses either. Is actually the, is the vegetation is tend to be very low, it out. and it's, there's a lot of lichens in there. Uh, on the ground, so uh, is, there's not a whole lot of pure grazers there either. Did, did yes, but uh, change during the radiation so they the browsers, uh, during the uh, season, they, they, they certainly become progressively more of a browser, uh, and so more of a grazer. Uh, in other words, they their horn, they, their teeth become taller and taller. Uh, that usually is a good indication that uh, their teeth are being used for tougher grasses, the drier grasses on the ground rather than the, the leaves. You have a question? Yes. Uh, did, they die, did they die at the same time as woolly mammoth did? When was woolly mammoth did? Do they, what do we mean that do, the, who? Uh, did, did they die during the same time as woolly mammoth? The woolly rhinos with the mammoths, right? But uh, they are approximately the same time. Uh, also, there are some uh, small group of uh, uh, woolly mammoths survived in a island, uh, Ranger Island, uh, up to about six thousand years ago. So there are a few stragglers of mammoths were able to survive, but the vast majority of the uh, the woolly mammoths. And woolly rhino, I think, more or less died together at the end of the ice age. Do the uh, woolly mammoth and woolly rhino and modern or African rhinos have common ancestor? Or? They ultimately has a common ancestor, but their common ancestor go back a few million years ago. Uh, they are not very closely related. There are, in other words, there are a few fossil rhinos that are closer to the woolly rhino lineage than the modern uh, rhinos. In fact, the, the modern uh, African white rhino is the closest, uh, un, uh, sister, what we call sister group, basically the closest species pair of the woolly rhino. Um, but but that, it, it, 
it's, it's just by degrees, basically. Um, they are not very, very small. They're, they they have diverged, the lineage of African white rhino have diverged from woolly rhino as, at least five million, probably more, years ago. You have a question, yes. Did the woolly rhino have any natural predators? Probably not. Uh, giants, uh, uh, it, 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 as a general rule, all of the, the giants, giants like elephants and rhinos, uh, has no natural predator, and there usually that most mostly is the reason that they become the the the, the giants. Uh, it's they are just completely free of predation, except when they are very very young. Um, for other reasons, uh, I mean the conservation of of nutrients, not conservation, needing less nutrients for larger body size is also uh, advantageous. Basically, a larger animal proportionally need less, a little less nutrition to s sustain themselves as compared to a mouse-like animal. A mouse has to eat constantly eating to keep up the, the, the metabolism. Um, was the woolly rhinos and the elephants the same migrate to Africa and then diverge into the different species, or well, how did they get to Africa from all the way from Russia? Uh, that, that's a good question. Uh, they, uh, that part, I personally do not have the answer. I think uh, some of my co-authors probably can answer that question. Uh, my my guess is that uh, through a, uh, a fossil uh, species or a genus called Stefano rhinus, which lives in Europe and Asia. Uh, that group really is the immediate ancestor to woolly rhino. Um, also, Stefano rhino ultimately goes back to the white rhino in Africa. So maybe ultimately they all came from Africa. Or maybe uh, African white rhino actually came from Europe and Asia. Um, that, that's also a possible scenario. Yes. What happened? What caused their demise? The woolly rhino demise. The woolly rhino demise. Uh, that uh, again is is uh, is hard to tell. Is uh, I think I think climate change is probably the most important factor um, since they are not. Woolly rhino has never made it to North America, uh, and therefore we cannot blame on um, humans for their extinction. Humans were in Eurasia um, all the time uh, during those uh, late Pleistocene, but humans apparently have less of an impact in wiping out the megafauna than humans did in the North America, or for that matter, in Australia. So it's a, it's, a, it's a mystery. A lot of them as a, uh, 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 the extinction are still very, very contentiously debated. Mm -hmm. yeah, I just wondered, are humans associated with woolly rhino as predators at all? That's a good question. I haven't thought about that. Um, uh, uh, certainly the artists have seen them, and they have really, really close look at it. And what was the very, question? Very, Can you repeat it? Uh, good rendering, rendering of it. Um, so um, if, if humans can hunt down woody mammoths, then... Oh, really? Okay, well, well, Doc said that there, there are at least some sites that may have yeah. some association of kill uh, sites or something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I'm not uh, aware of that yet. Yeah. Is there enough uh, fossil data to tell you about populations so that can see if it was like being good in near, near extinction during the warmer periods? Uh, our, our fossil record is probably nowhere nearly uh, as dense as to really tell that kind of a story. We sometimes we have um, we have some fossil record uh, we, we we call it interglacial versus glacial records. Mm -hmm. um, basically, during the warm period and during the cold period, and you compare these and then trying to gauge at some kind of a populational level changes through time. Uh, those are actually quite 
to deal with. Uh, and there's a lot of people who do those kind of studies uh, still come up with a lot of unanswered questions. I, I don't think we can really directly answer those questions. We have some indirect approach to that. Um, um, is that I think it's fair to assume basically when you have these ice coming down from northern part, uh, a lot of the animals that are living near the front of the ice, uh, ice, ice sheet get pushed down south. And then they, as soon as the ice goes back up, and they happily goes back up. So there is a lot of very radical geo geographic variations. They are they're constantly being pushed up and down, up and down du during the ice age. Uh, and their home range is being compressed during the ice age because, I mean, all of these animals that are living high up there have to make a living down there with the natives there. Here. Yeah. Yes. Yes, dog. Um, I'm sorry, I can't resist, but have you found any Yeti fossils? Oh. <laughs> 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 where are you looking? <laughs> yeah, where are you looking? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, I, I didn't even think about finding yet Yeti fossils. <laughs> <laughs> yeti fossils. <laughs> How about That's the last hilarious. You had, you had a last question? <laughs> somebody over here. Um, Do you still uh, have a I, Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. There might be so multiple in general. Wait a minute. I think animal <laughs> extinctions, like um, crabs. Right. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll get to her. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes. Um. I. Um. Uh, um. Perhaps there are not just one cub. Like this species was wiped out by climate change or human hunting. Perhaps there could be like multiple. Things. Causes. Like, That's right. Like yes. Two or more. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Certainly, disease uh, has been proposed, and also uh, meteorite has been linked to northern some North American extinctions. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Why well, don't I talk I to you after after the talk? Okay. Um. um I. So let's give uh, the lady a chance here. Okay. Go ahead. In general, would you say then that the woolly mammoth would have been sort of confined to the Tibetan Plateau had not the right. ice come down. Right. I think that, that that's a fair assumption. I it would, just gave I would, them the bridge to Yeah, I would say that, 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 that could be a very good scenario uh, to envision how the woolly rhino, if there was never an ice age, uh, there may be still woolly rhinos surviving they, there. They were too well dressed to Right, come right. They, they, they were just happily living uh, in Tibet. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that yeah, that that could very well be. Yes, yes. So I think uh, I'd be happy to uh, to just take more questions. I think uh, um, uh, I want to thank everyone to be here and. Uh,